I'm Yolande Poirier from Oracle Technology Network, and I'm here today at Javaland with Sarah White. Sarah, hi. Hi. <laughs> so, we, uh, so your topic is um, documentation. So mm -hmm. tell us um, why is documentation so important? Documentation is important because we always want more people to use our projects, to know if our projects are useful, um, helping people solve problems, and without documentation, it's hard to get people that you haven't spoken to face-to-face -to, -face to know that it can help them, um, to know what its features are, and then to get the feedback back of how it, it's working for them and what new features it should have. So um, I think documentation is important to grow like your community, to get feedback, to make sure it's actually useful to people. Um, otherwise, you're kind of developing in a bubble, and sometimes those features can um, help people, but maybe you didn't optimize them in the best way. Um, you haven't added other features that would make the, the chain go smoothly. And then my um, personal focus is in helping projects um, develop documentation for all levels of users mm -hmm. and users with all different types of backgrounds. So from new programmers who mm -hmm. you know are just starting out in the field, whether they've had an education in it or not, to people say they're in Java but they're coming they they came from a different background of uh, you know Ruby or JavaScript and whatnot. They the same concepts that we use in Java all the time might mean different things to them. Mm -hmm. So kind of um, one thing that I like to tell people is don't make any assumptions that say component means the same thing to you that it means to them even though they have a background in programming. So, um, so I, have any, um, I like to outreach to the community and programmers and talk about uh, documentation and audiences as a, as a big focus from not just beginner, intermediate, and um, advanced, but also to different um, ways that people learn now. I mean, it's not all desktop and right. just go with a textbook and learn. So I mean, uh, how, do you, how do you make sure that people who, are, who have a different background mm -hmm. know? So, I mean, do you have a system of feedback? I mean, how do you figure out um, um, well, whether or not your documentation uh, is working, basically? Yeah, right? exactly. Well, first time, um, if I go through a process with a project that's new, starting out just wants to um, improve its documentation or has no documentation to start with at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, the number one thing is, is to go out and talk to people who are already using your project. Conferences like this at Javaland are a great way to interact with users or potential users, someone using a tool already. And so I talk to them about um, how they learned, if not the tool that we're already interested in, any programming tool, like did you learn it in, in college courses or did you learn it online? Um, how did you go through that? And that's mm -hmm. our number one thing, to get like the audiences that we already have and make sure the materials are already reaching to them. And then we look at new um, segments of people that we're not touching but that we think we can help, you know, because our big thing is like, you know, you can write the greatest documentation in the world, but if it's not, your thing doesn't solve a problem that people have, it, it doesn't matter that way. So then, but that's a great part of getting to know new people who aren't using your stuff, because then they have problems, you, they have, you discover new problems to solve, and so the project just keeps building on itself. By looking at how to improve the documentation, you start to realize new features to mm -hmm. add to the code. And so a lot of times just by me, say, interviewing 20 users of various projects at a conference like this, um, I can map out a, a development roadmap for a project for the next year at a minimum wow. a lot of times. And then you know since these are features that people really want that would help them in their day-to-day -day lives, it's like you know that feature is going to be used. And then that really engages them though, then because you talk to them, 
they know you are interested um, in helping them, so mm -hmm. they will give great feedback. They will go through all the beta testing for you and release candidates, and they're really honest, and then they're like, this is now helping me. And then we can continue that relationship on and on, and then the, by writing good documentation, exactly how someone uses it in the real world um, helps it connect to other mm -hmm. people. So I'm really, um, I'm a little bit of getting away, even though I have a lot of, I guess, traditional formal education, getting away from that model of, of textbooks. And, you know, in my talk, I, I was talking about, like, how a big, thick user manual isn't really useful to most people. In uh, a lot of user interviews of just any project that people talk to, they're like, the last place I look for information is mm -hmm. the user manual of a project. Because it's uh, dry and badly written. Yeah, and if you don't <laughs> already know the specific term True. that you were looking for, and let's face it, most haven't really put a lot of metadata in, it's really mm -hmm. difficult to then find that thing in the user manual, even True. if you're already yep. experienced with the project. So how do you structure that? I mean, I, so, I mean, do you ask for feedback? Or I mean, how do you then, when, once you go through the initial stage of like putting your, your doc first draft of a documentation? Mm -hmm. So of course, you will have your top users, but then you have like plenty of other users, right? I mean, it's yeah. like the, it's a big world yeah. out there with a lot of needs. <laughs> it is, it is. So, and it, if you try to tackle all of your users and all of their needs, um, right from the start, it's really overwhelming, especially if you have even a project that just say does some really simple, you know, basic features. Um, so by going back to the, the user kind of interviews and interacting with them at conferences like this, um, we tend to, it becomes very clear what the most common use cases mm. and workflows are. So then I tend to recommend for those cases that your, your tutorials, your quick starts, follow that most common use case that users um, follow and then provide linking out to really rich metadata linking to areas that are specialties. Like if you wanna learn more about this subject or you need slightly different options, go over to this guide instead of trying to do every option that you could do for that feature all in one kind of tutorial. So it also makes dynamic, basically, yes, right? I yeah. mean, and so, and do you find formats working better than others? I mean, are the videos the way to learn or is this um, that spending all your time on, on YouTube <laughs> <laughs> will make you the great no. programmer? Um, what I found, it, it's very interesting. People are very attached to a certain way, like, a certain way of learning mm -hmm. works best for them. And for some people, that's video. For some people, they want to have text in, and read that. And then other people, they need an interactive, say someone is giving a lesson in a video and you can code like in a console right on okay. the side with quizzes um, mm -hmm. back and forth that way. Um, so in, a, in the best case scenario where you would have all the time and funding and, and volunteers and, and subject right. matter experts, you would create your your documentation, tutorials, quick starts, how to do in all of those formats. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But that's not really possible. I mean, from my research, the most favored method is a short tutorial. So. Um, a very direct title with you're going to learn the one or two goals mm -hmm. and here's step one, step two, step three with an example building and here is the output that you should get if you've successfully completed yeah. this tutorial. That tends to be a favorite in written method and then you would follow that up in some cases with a video. Think short. 10 minutes, we're, we're all really busy, you know, and it's like watching more than a 10 minute YouTube video, you know, you have colleagues that, that interrupt you or, or kids if you right. work from home. So when that gives it nice little fast snippets and you're like, I achieved that goal today. And that's part of that. Then from that um, tutorial, you give them the next steps or further information that they can follow in the chain of like, okay, I've learned this now. The next most common things that people do with this tool are this and this, so I'm gonna go and learn those. So do you see a difference between uh, generations? So people learning differently or because it's... Um, I don't know if, if there's generations, it's more of like what people are 
a habit sim, but I don't I see think. clear. Like, it's very, like, um, if we just talk of, say, new programmers coming on who are, say, just out of high school or, or university, I mean, I think they they really connect mm. with like the code academy like the the online learning which is a lot of that interaction with a video and maybe mm -hmm. a transcript and then being able to interactively manipulate or take little quizzes and get like those achievements going um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, otherwise mm -hmm. but it tends to people like it first and foremost people just like good um, documentation short whatever the format is if it's clear so, right. it actually works and it's correct and they they can know this will if I learn this it will solve my problem mm -hmm, I think mm -hmm. that's our problem sometimes we tend to get a little too abstract in our titles and that's why it makes <laughs> it difficult to to find the good the documentation to solve your your problem so I'm like so, be direct just lay it all right out in the title very specific so what about the devices I mean do people learn now more on the desktop do they use their tablets is it the phone mm -hmm. I mean do they do that on the go so yeah. I mean all that I think um, obviously like you know, here at Javelin there's a lot of the enterprise audience and people more on the, the, the business to business kind of, of connections and I think probably like that's still kind of your laptop more traditional what we think of how documentation but I definitely see um, as you moving forward and also on an international level in different countries that people are doing a lot more on their phones and and their tablets like even I am um, uh, actually learning a new a new language so I was trying to pick up a little bit of German before I came here to Javelin and I was using two programs that can be both on your laptop and on your phone and they interact with one another so and I love it on the phone because I could sit on the train right. and and go through that and try out the lessons um, another a number of the pro learn how to program sites as well that are interactive they all have phone apps and that's how like new programmers are learning mm -hmm. so and I also think it's how people in a lot of other countries you know after, when you get outside of um, the US or, or just different um, segments of the population are much more attached like their phone they never had a desktop or a laptop right. in the home and so they're like if I can't do it on my phone it doesn't really exist for me. And I think that's horrible that we are blocking those segments of the population. Right. We're losing all of that, that innovation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you so much for Thank sharing you. your experience. I mean, mm -hmm. very insightful. Thank you. Thank you.